Welcome to this presentation. The title of my talk is Social Shutdowns as an Extraordinary Means of Saving Life. Terror on every side. These frightening words are from the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah served God during the reigns of Judah's last kings. As a prophet, he was gifted to preach God's saving word to those kings and their subjects. King and people sadly resisted Jeremiah's life-giving message. The chapters of his book are filled with accounts of the verbal and physical attacks he had to endure. In verses leading up to the statement, for example, a chief officer of the temple had Jeremiah struck with blows and then held in the stocks. In spite of such dire circumstances, Jeremiah remains confident of God's help as he proclaims, the Lord is with me like a mighty champion. These days we again hear dire warnings of terror on every side. We might say that this has been the message repeated almost 24-7 since March 2020 regarding the coronavirus pandemic. Terror on every side. Yes, the prospect of serious illness and possible death from a novel virus for which we do not have a vaccine can be terrifying. So the question is whether we still believe and can confidently proclaim, as Jeremiah did, that the Lord is with me like a mighty champion. In the Gospel of St. Matthew, Jesus reminds his disciples of the refrain we hear throughout the scriptures, be not afraid. But on one occasion, he added more specificity. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. We know that Gehenna is the term used in the Bible to refer to an abyss of darkness, chains, and burning flames in a valley of unquenchable fire. In other words, what we call hell. In recent months, we have heard regular briefings coming from the White House and governor's offices across the country where government officials and health experts have been giving dire warnings about a virus that can kill the body. But we have heard very few warnings about moral hazards that can kill the soul. Some, for example, have said that access to liquor, cannabis, casinos, and abortion is essential, but going to church and access to the sacraments are not. We have also taken the extraordinary and unprecedented step of shutting down a major portion of our economy for the past several months, telling people to stay home, not to go to work, and not to go to school. That may not be too great a problem for those who can work or continue their education online, but that is not possible for everyone. The United States Department of Commerce said in July 2020 that the U.S. gross domestic product, the value of all goods and services produced across the economy, fell at a seasonally and inflation-adjusted 32.9% annual rate in the second quarter of 2020, or a 9.5% drop compared with the prior quarter. The figures were the steepest declines in more than 70 years of record-keeping. Meanwhile, unemployment claims rose to 1.43 million people. The second quarter economic contraction came as states imposed lockdowns in March and April to contain the coronavirus pandemic, triggering a steep drop in output, and then lifted the restrictions in May and June, allowing growth to resume. So as we look back at what we have done and look forward to consider how we will respond in the future if there should be a second wave of COVID-19 or some other novel virus sweeping the world, I think it would be helpful to call to mind some Catholic moral principles to help illuminate how to address a pandemic. First, while we recognize that our human life is one of our greatest gifts, it is not a moral absolute and, in fact, a secondary to the eternal life of our immortal soul. In our fallen, though redeemed state, our human life on earth is limited, it is passing. We have the responsibility to treat our life and the lives of all others with respect and reverence, and as a general rule, we are obliged to maintain its health and strength at all times, intervening with the blessings of scientific medicine and skilled care when necessary for its continuation. But things like martyrdom or attempting to save the life of another are examples of where even our human life on earth can be rightly placed at the service of a higher good. Second, recognizing that our human life is passing, there are circumstances when it is just to decline medical treatment due to the fact that they would be considered extraordinary to the situation. Some of the reasons why they could be termed extraordinary would be that they do not have a significant expectation of success. 
that they would be judged as too burdensome for the benefit they would offer, that they would only prolong suffering and not give reasonable expectation for recovery based on the suffering they would cause, that they would be too expensive to undertake or exhaust the resources that could be better used to save others, or that they only prolong the inevitable and approaching death. Deciding to forego such treatments is in no way a refusal of life, but a recognition that even life is passing. This is quite separate from the always immoral actions which would intentionally hasten death and are undertaken with that intention, such as euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. Third, medical professionals work with those incompetent authority over others, in some cases, family members with medical power of attorney, for those who cannot make the decision themselves, to make prudent decisions regarding which therapies or treatments to utilize or to decline. Fourth, medical science and government leaders are called to act in a way to protect the health of our population. Looking at this by way of analogy to the situations affecting decisions about utilizing or declining treatment in the cases of individual sicknesses and diseases, these principles could be taken into consideration for the societal treatment of a pandemic. In this regard, Catholic medical ethics has used the standard of ordinary and extraordinary means of preserving life since it was first articulated in these terms by Pope Pius XII in his November 24, 1957 address to Catholic physicians and anesthesiologists. The Holy Father said, Normally, one is held to use only ordinary means, according to the circumstances of persons, places, times, and culture, that is to say, means that do not involve any grave burden for oneself or another. A stricter obligation would be too burdensome for most people and would render the attainment of the higher, more important good too difficult. Life, health, all temporal activities are, in fact, subordinated to spiritual ends. On the other hand, One is not forbidden to take more than the strictly necessary steps to preserve life and health, as long as one does not fail in some other more serious duty. In other words, while one may voluntarily take on an extraordinary burden to preserve life, one has no moral obligation to do so. It is not a sin to decline a treatment, for example, because it is too expensive and one does not have the financial resources. Moreover, it is not a sin to decline artificial life support machines for a terminally ill person when such treatment would only prolong the suffering of a person who is in the active stage of dying. When Pope John Paul II was dying, for example, he was not rushed to the hospital to be kept on life support indefinitely. Rather, the Holy Father, who was staunchly pro-life, was allowed to die peacefully and gave us a powerful example of how to die naturally. Pope St. John Paul II addressed this question himself in his 1995 encyclical Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life, considered to be the seminal document on the protection of the life and dignity of the human person. In this encyclical, St. John Paul II made the distinction between euthanasia and foregoing aggressive medical treatment. Euthanasia must be distinguished from the decision to forego so-called aggressive medical treatment. In other words, medical procedures which no longer correspond to the real situation of the patient, either because they are by now disproportionate to any expected results or because they impose an excessive burden on the patient and his family. In such situations, when death is clearly imminent and inevitable, one can certainly in conscience refuse forms of treatment that would only secure a precarious and burdensome prolongation of life so long as the normal care due to the sick person in similar cases is not interrupted. It is important to keep Catholic principles such as these in mind when considering the societal response to a pandemic, or for that matter, to any threat to human life. If we had a moral obligation to use every possible means, even extraordinary means, to preserve life, then we should not even get into our cars, since there is a risk that we could be killed given the fact that About a 1,000 people die every year in Illinois in automobile accidents, and over 35,000 people have died nationwide in auto accidents every year since 1951. We do not stop driving, however, and there is no moral imperative to stop driving because we recognize that it would be an extraordinary burden on everyday life if people could not get to where they need to be for work, school, family, and other obligations to which they must attend. Instead, We take safety precautions to minimize the risk, such as using seatbelts, deploying airbags, 
and following the rules of the road. Similarly, in the face of a pandemic, do we have a moral obligation to shut down our society, require people to stay at home, put employees out of work, send businesses into bankruptcy, impair the food supply chain, and prevent worshipers from going to church? I would say no. That would be imposing unduly burdensome and extraordinary means. While some people may voluntarily adopt such means, only ordinary means that are not unduly burdensome are morally required to preserve life, both on the part of individuals as well as society as a whole. The burdens of lockdowns and other restrictions on normal human interactions are not just economic, but also social. While I do not like the term social distancing, it is not altogether incorrect. I do not like the term social distancing because it seems to imply social isolation. But that seems to be precisely what is happening in our society. People are becoming isolated from each other as they shrink in fear of human interaction. I prefer to use the terms such as safe distancing or physical distancing to describe the practice of keeping an adequate distance from others in order to reduce the risk of contagious contamination while trying to maintain social interaction as much as possible. A striking example of the detrimental effects of locking things down is what happened when my father's older sister, my Aunt Marion, who is also my godmother, turned 102 years old on March 25th. Aunt Marion lives in her own independent living apartment within a retirement community near Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. She is mentally sharp and physically doing pretty well for her age. Normally, I would have said she celebrated her 102nd birthday, but this year it was not much of a celebration. When I called that morning to wish her a happy 102nd birthday, she answered the phone, but I could tell she was crying. I asked her what was wrong. She said, it was a very sad day. So I asked her why. She said her daughter Pamela had come with her husband, along with Aunt Marion's great granddaughter, to wish her a happy birthday. But the staff of the retirement home would not let them through the front door because of the safety restrictions put in place to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus. With my cousin standing in the foyer while my Aunt Marion was in the lobby, separated by the glass windows and doors, all they could do was wave at each other. The most I could do was assure her that I would come and celebrate with her as soon as the situation improves, when visits would be permitted again. At this point, however, I worry more that my Aunt Marion will die of a broken heart rather than the coronavirus. Indeed, with very limited family visits since March, she has declined rapidly and has been moved from her apartment to assisted living. Painful scenes like these are playing out across the world. A couple of days after my aunt's birthday, I received an email from a former Swiss guard who wrote, the virus took my dad, Alberto, in just three days. My parents live in Northern Italy. I'm an only child. My poor mom can't go out. Nobody can go in. They took my dad's body and told my mom they will bring her some ashes in a month or so. Awful. Yes, this is awful. Even spouses within the same nursing home have been confined to separate spaces and not allowed to see each other for months. As we all try to cope as best we can under these circumstances, it is crucial that we not forget the role that our faith can and must have in the midst of a crisis such as this. While attention rightfully focuses on the advice of healthcare experts and the decisions that government officials must make to protect public health and safety, we must at the same time keep God front and center in our awareness and maintain a vigorous life of prayer, trusting in God's providence to deliver us from evil and affliction. A more favorable outcome occurred with the 92-year-old father of a 63-year-old man that I ordained to the priesthood this past June. The father's family was making plans for him to watch the ordination and first mass of his son via video live stream rather than in person. The father said, I am 92 years old. I've had a good life. If it is the last thing I do, I am going to be at my son's ordination and first mass. He was there in person with appropriate safety precautions, and thanks be to God, he suffered no ill effects by doing so. In the canon law courses that I teach at Notre Dame Law School, I emphasize the principle that law follows theology. In canon law specifically, the canons are not composed arbitrarily in a vacuum, but are based on an underlying theology. All of the canons dealing with the sacraments, for example, flow from the sacramental theology with under, which undergirds them. A similar principle is involved in the formulation of civil law. Civil laws should not be posited simply as a ruthless imposition of authority, 
simply because a government official has the power to do so. Civil law should be based on and flow from natural law, which is the innate sense of right and wrong written into our hearts by God and which can be discerned through the use of right reason. Thus, civil law flows from ethics. Not all moral values need be legislated or coerced as legally binding, but laws are normally enacted because they flow from ethical principles that are recognized and accepted by the community as being necessary to protect the common good. This can be seen in the criminalization of murder, rape, theft, and perjury. These are crimes not simply because they violate various prescriptions of the Ten Commandments, but because they are universally recognized as harmful to the common good of society. But not everything that may cause harm needs to be or should be proscribed. Burdens and benefits must be weighed in the balance, along with competing claims of rights. I saw an illustration of this in a television interview with a teacher who was trying to make her case that schools should not be reopened because she thought it would be too risky to do so. When the interviewer pointed out that young children are not a high-risk group in terms of becoming seriously ill with COVID-19, and they have not shown high rates of transmission of the novel coronavirus, the teacher responded, well, even if the rates are low, the risk is still there. And then she added, apparently thinking this was the clincher of her moral argument, somebody could die. If somebody could die were the sole criterion for deciding to engage in any given behavior, we would be paralyzed by fear to do anything. If somebody could die were the simple moral standard that could disqualify partaking in any human activity, then I should not be running marathons or playing hockey, even though mortality rates are low for these activities. On the other hand, Physical inactivity is a morbidity factor for heart disease, some cancers, and stroke. So, staying in bed all day is not a morally acceptable alternative either. So, what is a person to do? It is here that the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of preserving life is important. For if a means is extraordinary, that is, if the burdens outweigh the benefits, then it is not morally obligatory and should not be coerced by state power. In this regard, a good example of properly weighing the burdens and benefits of reopening schools can be seen in a report that appeared on NBC Nightly News on July 12, 2020, in which five pediatricians from across the country were asked if it is safe for students and teachers to return to schools. They unanimously and emphatically responded, yes. All five of these doctors from California, Tennessee, New York, New Jersey, and Vermont also answered without hesitation that they would be absolutely comfortable sending their own children back to school. The five pediatricians agreed that the benefits of children being back at school outweigh the risks. As the report notes, in fact, kids account for only 2% of all cases. Doctors say they don't expect that number to significantly increase when schools open because kids don't appear to be good at spreading the virus. The American Academy of Pediatrics has articulated very sound reasons for having students physically present in school and their guidance for school re-entry, saying, the importance of in-person learning is well documented, and there is already evidence of the negative impacts on children because of school closures in the spring of 2020. Lengthy time away from school and associated interruption of supportive services often results in social isolation, making it difficult for schools to identify and address important learning deficits, as well as child and adolescent physical or sexual abuse substance abuse, depression, and suicidal ideation. This in turn places children and adolescents at considerable risk of morbidity and in some cases, mortality. With regard to government orders shutting down religious services, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit got it right in enjoining the governor and other Commonwealth officials in Kentucky from enforcing orders prohibiting drive-in services at the Maryville Baptist Church if the church, its ministers, and its congregants adhere to the public health requirements mandated for life-sustaining entities. As the court explained, the breadth of the ban on religious services, together with a haven for numerous secular exceptions, should give pause to anyone who prizes religious freedom. In contrast, the United States Supreme Court got it wrong in the case of South Bay United Pentecostal Church et al. versus Gavin Newsom, governor of California ruling that the governor could discriminate against houses of worship in placing numerical restrictions on public gatherings to address the coronavirus pandemic. 
In his dissenting opinion, Justice Kavanaugh was joined by Justices Thomas and Gorsuch in saying, I would grant the church's requested temporary injunction because California's latest safety guidelines discriminate against places of worship and in favor of comparable secular businesses. Such discrimination violates the First Amendment. In response to the COVID-19 health crisis, California has now limited attendance at religious worship to 25% of building capacity or 100 attendees, whichever is lower. The basic constitutional problem is that comparable secular businesses are not subject to a 25% occupancy cap, including factories, offices, supermarkets, restaurants, retail stores, pharmacies, shopping malls, pet grooming shops, bookstores, florists, hair salons, and cannabis dispensaries. Similarly, in a 5-4 to four decision on July 24, 2020, with Chief Justice John Roberts siding with the majority, as he did in the California case in May, the United States Supreme Court upheld Nevada's limits on congregation sizes, denying a request by a Nevada church for permission to have larger gatherings that are currently permitted in the state's casinos, restaurants, and other businesses. The church, Calvary Chapel, Dayton Valley, challenged the state's limit of 50 people only at worship services, while other places were allowed to operate at 50% capacity during the pandemic. Justice Samuel Alito, writing a dissent joined by Justices Clarence Thomas and Brett Kavanaugh, said, The Constitution guarantees the free exercise of religion. It says nothing about the freedom to play craps or blackjack, to feed tokens into a slot machine, or to engage in any other game of chance. Justice Neil Gorsuch, in his own dissent, said the current pandemic poses unusual challenges, but he said the Constitution does not permit the state of Nevada to, quote, favor Caesar's palace over Calvary Chapel. As the dissenting opinions argue so well in these two cases, there is a troubling trend for government officials to subordinate the free exercise of religion to other less morally compelling considerations. In canon law, the highest good is expressed in the phrase salus animarum suprema lex, which is found in the very last canon of the Code of Canon Law, as promulgated for the Latin Church by Pope St. John Paul II in 1983. This phrase is based on the maxim of Roman law as articulated by Cicero, salus populi suprema lex, which means the health of the people is the highest law. The adaptation of this maxim in canon law is translated as the salvation of souls is the supreme law. Physical health is important, but the highest good is eternal life. The free exercise of religion and access to the means of salvation established by Christ through the church must have priority in the moral and legal order. As we reflect on our moral obligations in light of the coronavirus pandemic, we do well to remember these basic teachings of Catholic moral theology, as well as the words of Jesus himself. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. Thank you for watching this presentation. The text of this talk will be published by the National Catholic Bioethics Center in an upcoming issue of their Ethics and Medics newsletter. God bless you.